Um, hello. Nice to see you all again. <laughs> and there's uh, sun coming from the rear, grilling everybody. Uh, please still remember, drink more water and keep the walkways free. As we talked so much already, uh, due to the power failure, sadly, neither on the stream nor on the recording, um, I, without further ado, um, give it to Gabriela uh, Biela Coleman and to Jeremy Hammond to uh, talk uh, about activism. Great. Thanks so much. All right, so I'll be contextualizing the hack and leak, no surprise. Um, so I have a very specific definition for the hack and leak. So it's a tactic executed by hacker outsiders who hack deliberately into some org server place to snatch documents and material. They publicize the intrusion, that's really important, and stolen material to drum up interest in the leaks. It was initially used mainly for whistleblowing, but is now also used by different actors, like nation states, for different purposes. I'll be concentrating more on this sort of hacktivist tactic. Today, it's really a firm part of the hacktivist landscape. Um, Guacamaya, if you have not heard of them, are rocking the hack and leak in Latin America. They hacked the Mexican military, for example. And really, since 2011 and 12, you really just have a tremendous amount of sort of hacktivist activity with this very deliberate tactic. As I sort of mentioned, um, after our technical snafu, this was so not obvious to put together the chocolate hack and the peanut butter leak and put them together. And in fact, one of the fascinating things was that I interviewed for a very different project a lot of hackers who were like pwning and owning systems in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and many were not ideologically inclined to do hacktivism, but some certainly were, and there were a lot of hacktivists doing also website defacements. And one hacker actually from Europe during an interview said, I wish we had done something about it, but we didn't. I think we could have exposed a lot of corruption, a lot of wrongdoing of a lot of high profile political people because they had access to their servers. Now, just to kind of give you a sense of how much more hacking and leaking we have, here's a list from 2010 to the present, and it's partial. I could add another dozen examples. Um, and before 2010, you've really got four in the sort of English-speaking world, at least, and only two of them really kind of fit with my definition. So as I mentioned, it was not obvious. Um, 2009 is really the first instance where you have this tactic fully formed. But what's interesting about the two, which I'll get to later, was that people didn't copycat them. And it wasn't until Anonymous, the hacktivist, actually independently and accidentally stumbled upon this tactic that then it really started to cement into a template for em emulation. So here's a very truncated genealogy. So even though I sort of identify 2009 as the kind of time where this came into being, I often like to give analog examples. And there is a really amazing example of a group of um, activists, the Citizens Commission to Expose the FBI. Who has heard of them? So a few, they actually broke into an FBI field office in Media, Pennsylvania, took like three, four suitcases of files, photocopied the documents, sent them to journalists, and eventually COINTELPRO, one of the most horrific sort of programs against um, activists was exposed. And this is a kind of hack and leak. Obviously, it's very hard to break into a building and take documents, so that wasn't really replicated very often. Now, it wasn't until 2003 where you have something similar, where you have some big email dumps that were not from hacks. And one has to do with the Diebold voting machine. Um, someone found documents and source code and email on an unencrypted FTP server, took them, and then some obscure government official kind of dumped the Enron emails. They were in, involved in fraud. And these were super interesting because basically journalists could not be bothered to mine them, right? And it took amazing amount of effort to even sort of cover the documents that were found. Um, in the case of Diebold, for example, there were some stories about the vulnerabilities, 
But in this piece, actually, Paul Krugman is reflecting why the fuck didn't anyone go into the documents and emails and report on them? Now, going through email is a bitch. No one likes to do it. It's difficult. You didn't really have boutique tech reporting as much as you ch ju did today. So there's reasons for that. But I think it also shows that it really wasn't on people's mental map. So in 2009, you have two bona fide hacks and leaks. You have one against a university in England, and it was Climate Gate. And we don't know who took those emails. Um, they dumped them to kind of seed mistrust around climate science, and this got a lot of news. It was all over the news. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, it didn't seem to inspire copycats. The second one was given to WikiLeaks and was signed anti-fascist hackers and it was against Holocaust denier David Irving and it did make a little bit of the press and eventually we learned that it was Jeremy Hammond who did it and this is again one of the first bona fide hacks and leaks. Fucking Nazi, uh, hack Nazi website. Now what's so interesting is that, you know, eventually I could sort of interview him about this stuff and I sort of asked about like, kind of, where did you get this idea? What was your sort of inspiration, right? It wasn't that one day he's like, here's the peanut butter, here's the chocolate, I'll put it together. He was part of the Hacker Underground and there was a cultural movement called Antisec. Who here heard, heard of Antisec? Not the recent one, but the one from early 2000s. Yeah, Antisec won. Very few people. So in the early 2000s, a bunch of hackers who were part of the underground were professionalizing. They were getting jobs. And there was a small crew of people who were like, screw that. We want to preserve our cultural kingdom. We want our exploits and vulnerabilities. So they went on a rampage against white hat hackers. And what they did was they hacked them, took their emails, dumped them, but not for whistleblowing. It was just for shaming them, right? And Jeremy was like, that's badass, but maybe we can reformulate that and reformat that for political purposes. And initially, he would take emails and then share them with a small network of people, not publicly. And it wasn't until the WikiLeaks era where, again, the chocolate and peanut butter came together. So he did this in 2009. He's on probation very independently. Anonymous comes into being, and very accidentally, I don't have the time to go into the details, they start to stumble on emails, into emails, sometimes not through hacks, sometimes through hacks, and it's all over the news. Jeremy's on the sidelines, he's super excited. At a certain point, he's like, I can't help myself, I'm going to kind of join, and he does when LulzSec is disbanding, and very deliberately creates anti-sec a kind of new version where you're really deliberately hacking and leaking and some side of sabotage as well. Doing things like fuck FBI Fridays where you try to time a hack and leak every Friday. So that's a very brief genealogy. There's lots of interesting things else to say. But in 2012, a lot of people get arrested and it's not really clear whether this would continue, right? It's all over the news, but are people going to basically copycat it, right? And I wasn't sure myself. I myself at this point also thought this tactic exis existed since the 1980s. I took it for granted. In 2014, the answer came with LulzSec Peru, with Phineas Fisher. Then you also have Guardians of Peace, which is a nation state group, right? So the tactic begins to morph, but it really starts to grow some serious roots into the ground. And um, what is also interesting, and I'm wrapping up so that we could turn over to Jeremy, is that you have um, groups like Phineas Fisher who are not quite as visible. They're not there doing 50 days of hacking in a row. They're striking maybe one year a few times, then in 2016 for a few more times. But they're writing manifestos with extremely detailed instructions for how not to get caught. Right? And indeed, whether it's Phineas Fisher or Guacamaya, now we have this tactic where these groups, individuals, who knows who, are doing this but evading capture. So that's all I'm going to say. If you're interested in the 40 page version, um, feel free to email me. But otherwise, I'm now going to turn it over to Jeremy for his bit. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Full screen. Beale, you're the best. 
heck, this is a long time ago. I was just learning it myself, learning it by doing, basically. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a back-end coder, and, and I'm, I'm pretty skilled at remote intrusion, but uh, I'm not actually particularly, like, the best, right? But, and none of us are, but it's just, you know, what I found is that how many, like, 15 million security contractors are there that, that could be a potential Snowden but ain't? It's because, I don't know, in the United States, a lot of tech workers and developers are basically complicit with the, um, the system. How do I full screen this shit? This is very embarrassing. Well, I don't use PowerPoint, right? Oh, my God. Uh, Command F. So anyways, white hats. Oh my god. <laughs> Thunderbird? All right, so I have to do. This is also single slides, but I could just do it in mine. Sorry about this. There we go. All right, let's burn some shit. So it's time to draw a line in the sand and time for hackers to develop some class consciousness. You know, Occupy Wall Street, we're the 99%, but you know, there's obviously intersectionalities and so forth. And I think, honestly, we've been a little bit too patient with those who are complicit with the uh, corporate security. Uh, these professionals uh, are harmless now. Uh, now, granted, I'm, I am so inspired by what y'all have built here. Uh, I wish we could do the same thing in the United States where it's desperately needed. Um, but uh, what we have r right now, uh, how things have changed, you know, I just got a smartphone like two years for the first time when I got out of prison. Uh, I was on all these ridiculous monitoring shits. Um, and I was just coming to terms with the rise of big tech and uh, what Cory Doctorow calls in shitification and all these new complex ideologies that uh, Tess Creel is uh, like, you know, the Musks and the Peter Thiels uh, and this crypto stuff, uh, this futurism where those are left behind. And, and all this panopticon surveillance stuff would only be made possible by those developers who had chose the paycheck over principle and so and uh, you know hackers you know the vision of uh, if information was just free we'd all you know it all just result in this utopian but unfortunately was not able to contend with the forces of uh, neoliberal capitalism which is a masterful recuperation of hackers that's why you see hack labs turn to hacker spaces and now maker spaces and stuff like that and uh, and defcon and so forth right so it's time to make hacking a threat again I love those little fishes, man. Um, but hey, uh, so these are some uh, tips and stuff like that that I thought what were our strengths that made work. Uh, anonymity, encryption, OPSEC, compartmentalization, need to know. I will say that the reasons why I have been busted any of these times is not because of any of the failures of uh, the technology itself. First off, shout out to the Tor project. That, that shit, uh, I relied on that shit for nine months, and that's not how they caught me. You know what I mean? I, I made my own mistakes by running my mouth mostly and trusting people and so forth. But uh, encryption works. Al Snowden said it himself. But uh, if you just need to be precise, though, of course, right? Uh, what also works is uh, mimetic action, uh, replicable, replicable action, creating openings, be like water, like they said in Hong Kong, I believe. Uh, Basically, like I've worked in a lot of protests and, and organizations and so forth, right? And I, um, I'm an anarchist, but and so we have a, crit a criticism of uh, centralized and um, hierarchical organizational structures. And I think the future is more mimetic action. I think that's one of Anonymous's strengths is to learn how to the virality, and also because uh, it, you don't have to wait to do it yourself. You know, you could just be inspired. If you see something, it recognizes it. Like I have some examples down here. Uh, stuff like graffiti, raves, flash mobs, uh, hopping and turnstile, teen takeovers and so forth. Um, or like in, in Chicago, we have like these teen takeovers, these slides where people just have these spontaneous public gatherings and so forth. That just, it's guerrilla stuff, that hit and run. Uh, Diversity of tactics. Uh, you know, there's no one way to do it. There's many ways. There's many worlds. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to know what card to play at the right moment. Sometimes it's just got to boil over, though, and you got to take action. But this, you know, I, I came up, you know, handing flyers and going to anti-war protests and stuff like that, and uh, thinking possibly naively that you could change things by that the people in power will be willing to listen to you, or they'll be able to. You could re achieve reforms through the system. It took my head being whooped by batons. It took a lot of time in jail and, and a lot of bogus charges in jail. Sometimes it did. Sometimes it didn't do it, though. And, and I had to learn that the whole thing just has to go completely. 
right? And so direct action, hey, it gets the goods, baby. There's a lot of types of activism, though. You know, you don't all have to, we don't all got to be the hero to break stuff. You know, all, we choose our own level of involvement. We're all not uniquely positioned in our lives. Uh, again, there's all forms of defensive hacktivism. These hacker spaces uh, creating these incubations and developing software and audits are all part of, part of this diversity of, pro, uh, diversity of tactics. Um, decentralized deterrence. Uh, discourage recruitment of cops, law enforcement, white hats. If they thought, first off, a cop shouldn't be able to get a bar in any fucking place, you know, anywhere. They, uh, they shouldn't, you know, if, if, if white hats were like that too, maybe uh, we'd have less white hats uh, developing um, the hacking team spy shit, the surveillance, all that. Uh, so anti-sec, uh, big fan. Uh, we uh, chose targeting the white hats as the weak link because also, first off, their emails, they got the credentials, they got the live vulnerabilities, they got, they got the keys to the kingdom. So we're, we're after that shit. Get the mail, get it all. All right, <laughs> mistakes were made. But they didn't stop us from uh, learning our lessons and moving on. You know, uh, my first time I hacked uh, protest warriors, like a right wing uh, counter counter protester thing. They were uh, kind of like doxing us. And, and like uh, Biela had said, uh, a lot of the work um, I was doing was a lot of anti fascist work, uh, knowing and mapping the right wing networks. Um, and uh, again, like hacking, not all of it has to be spectacular front page news defacement. Sometimes it's lie quietly and listen, right? And, and knowing where to distribute that data to those that matter. You know, we need to know who these Nazis are in our neighborhoods. We need to know their connections, whether they are also police officers or work in security themselves or uh, generally. And, and also it works. You know what I mean? Uh, so the David Irving one, we, I went after that because he was on a speaking tour and uh, we did the secret location and all this type of stuff. And so we were able to hack his emails, get all the meeting locations. He had to cancel it. Also the attendees, those who attended, uh, these neo-Nazis and so forth. So now we, uh, we, uh, I chose to release it to WikiLeaks because that was uh, a stable platform that was at the time uh, that distributed no questions asked, right? And so uh, it's like, you know, it's one of the difficult things for those who are breaking in, whether it's physically, uh, to like the example you had mentioned, or digitally, like, but fortunately, y'all fucking the greatest because y'all, there's now many distributed uh, distribution systems, DDoS seekers, of course, right? Um, anyways, back to this. Imprecise and undisciplined technical execution, like you gotta be on point, right? Um, you know, it's like hacking and stuff is like you grind it. You, they're doing it for the paycheck, nine to five, but we're all night online, baby, you know what I mean? We just need to find that one mistake, right? But this, the reverse is true because you also have to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. And you know, you might get away with it or so you thought, but years later, man, that log file or whatever the fuck they did, Come get your ass. So just be precise. Um, persistent identities and crossing streams. Crossing streams. Okay, so I've hacked this site. I was, you know, using aliases tied to my name. I was young. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But while at the same time also breaking into shit. And then people are just obviously able to see two and two together because I did not compartmentalize my life. And uh, it was very easy for them to get. So you can't really do above ground and underground stuff at the same time. I mean, you can, but we all have a little bit of multiple personality stuff. But persistent identities. During Anonymous, I, I attempted to have multiple a dozen nicknames or something like that change at a different time and place, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you do a hack, it's not really a good idea to use the same identity over and over and over again because you keep them guessing, right? It's best to keep them guessing that they don't know. Unfortunately, I was talking to an informant who had knew all the nicknames anyway, so it didn't even really matter uh, in my case. But uh, that has to do with more of a choice about whether I chose to involve myself with a larger phenomenon and get involved publicly. We'll talk more about the to crew or not to crew later. Um, leaders, hierarchies, and pyramids, right? Obviously, you know, we, we already know all that. Ambiguous politics. I, I always say it's nice to know who you're getting involved with and know where you stand and let others know how you would react to a situation politically. Uh, Occupy Wall Street was uh, the 99%, but then you'd also have like a lot of right-wing Tea Partiers and even folks who believe that the uh, cops are part of the 99% too and stuff like that. Again, they had to wait until they got kicked out of a dozen cities by force by the police until they, oh, wait a minute, they're not on it, right? Um, no connection to local struggles. Hacktivist actions are really, you can't just like parachute in and think that you know what uh, a local struggle or those who are being oppressed by some type of corporation or government, got, you, we're just gonna come in and save the day. You know I mean? You really do have to understand the context and get involved to see what folks actually want. Uh, this, this synergy of activism hacking is, is at those little uh, intersections, those Venn diagrams is when you really uh, are effective though. Um, and it's, there's an, in the United States, there's actually not that much overlap between hacking and activism. From my personal perspective, you know, it, I've been to those 2600s and they, they just ain't into it. They just ain't into it. You talk, talk about anti-fascism, they'd be like, oh, that's scary, it's extreme, we don't want nothing to do with that anymore. Other problems, exclusivity, elitism, not sharing the knowledge and fun. You know, like, like, I'm a black hat, I understand, don't publish exploit code, don't uh, keep it private, I respect it, but also, like, we can't keep this specialized and in an insular uh, direct action. We need to share. And so, like, like Biela had uh, said, uh, Phineas and the Decepticons, I believe, not only did they hack some shit and leak some shit, they've also published DIY guides to showing, first off, how easy it is, uh, and that you could do it yourself, that you don't need to wait. Uh, working within the system, yeah, you know, we ain't doing all that. 
Uh, all right, I just do this and mistakes were made. Um, I didn't really intend to uh, talk in detail about how I was caught, uh, but I just do these couple slides here, just talk uh, the Tor correlation attack uh, is with an informant. Um, just, but we'll talk about that later. If you want to see me on a Saturday, come on, we'll go all into how OPSEC could go horribly wrong. Um, here's some more fashion tips for the brave. <laughs> This uh, black, so they reduce identifying. Um, this is more of a physical thing, but it also, I, th I thought it might have some analog stuff too, because, you know, writing in these IRC chat rooms and publishing press releases, I'm always curious to see how these intelligence uh, agencies like use language analysis and so forth to identify and tie together stuff. Or if you're smashing a window, like, like, wear all black. Don't be wearing these, the same sneaks that you'd be wearing all the time to catch your ass. And they do. They do. One mistake, so that's it, right? Because these motherfuckers have mastered the counterinsurgency, they know how to manage resistance uh, and recuperate. So, and they did so with anonymous. Um, and it, a lot of it has to do with maybe a little bit of weakness of the open nature of decentralized communities, right? They have just these chat rooms with thousands of people. You know who's in there? Logging, of course. Informants, of course. Uh, entrapment. That's, we could talk a little bit about that as well later. Uh, but they also try to discredit uh, those who are uh, working hard uh, on, on the right shit. They'll just throw shit at them. Co-option. They'll try to. Um, I have it listed down here, the Dutch formula, the divide and conquer, uh, other side of the coin are a few good papers that talk about some of the different divide and conquer strategies. Mostly between isolating good and bad protesters, whatever the hell that means, or, or even try to reduce it to a narrative of law and order or criminality, like, oh, we, we could have to be legal or we have to be pacifist is the only way, the one way or like that. And so one of the strategies is they isolate the radicals. They call us criminals, they call us, but listen, what I found is that I was handing out flyers and news, news getting my head beaten, they still call me a terrorist, I didn't even do that terrorist shit until many years later, because hey, they made me, they made me, <laughs> hey, um, uh, government corporate fascists co-opting the tactics and aesthetics of hackers and revolutionaries. We're seeing this uh, with QAnon, like they, they're trying to say there's some type of lineage. There's obviously no lineage, but they like the, uh, the aesthetics of rebellion and resistance. I always think it's hilarious, but right, put Rage Against the Machine as an example, because all these like anti-vaxxer right-wingers and stuff might just hear it for the first time because, it, you know, they only know what the hell to do it, and they think that it's, then they, wait, these are commies? These are fucking lefties? Fuck? It's like, uh, what the fuck? Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene selling defund the FBI shirts, right? But there's, uh, or the right-wing thinking that, like they're now trying to claim the mantle of free speech and stuff like that because they got fucking kicked off of Twitter. Man, how about you fucking try a month in the box because you posted some shit on Twitter? Or how about you write a letter to your fucking uh, judges sentencing and stuff like that? They take your email privileges away for fucking months, right? You know, try, try just doing handing leaflets and get your ass whooped and now these motherfuckers complaining about Twitter and stuff. Uh, and then of course, like Biela had mentioned, the hacked uh, state and governments also uh, are now adopting the hacking leaks themselves, right? Um, full circle, I suppose. Uh, you know, there's uh, the... Vault 7 revelation showed how also uh, the US CIA specifically has tools that could uh, misattribute a hack and make it appear like it comes from somewhere else. Um, and then they tried to muddy the waters too also with this Hunter Biden the laptop and the and DNC and stuff like that. So they're, they're, they're learning that some things are effective and in a way that it's a little bit more honest in a sense that they're not even, they're dropping the pretense of law and order because those democracies are sham in the first place and now they're doing the same shit we are. Like At least in the United States, they're just, it's, it's best past the breaking point. All right, just some critiques of leaking is not enough. Like BL had said, a lot of the work is honestly the journalism, digging through the databases. You know what I mean? Like, okay, you could hack some shit and get like 80 gigs of emails and SQLs and stuff like that. Like, you know, do we, who, who has time? You know, when I, when I was in my height, I had like hundreds and hundreds of targets, man. It's one of the reasons why I chose to go with WikiLeaks uh, to release the Straffer emails because they had teams of professionals and journalists uh, to be able to go through and look and find the stories, to, to find the scandals, uh, because destroying is great. Man, believe it, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But leaking is kind of has the long-term scandals that could make or break a presidency or, or uh, aspiring right-wing politician's career. So depancing the empire. Can I give one example? Yes. In Peru, uh, Lelsec Peru hacked um, the government, and they released emails that showed massive corruption, and then they were voting to disintegrate the government, and they didn't, but they needed one more vote to do so. So, making a difference. You, you, you could shape public perception and consciousness of the problem by exposing it. Um, and as outsiders, we're a little bit different from uh, whistleblowers. You know what I mean? I've, we're not military, we're not law enforcement. You know what I mean? We're, they're holding all the keys like in their little fortress and stuff like that. But again, if, if a smart person knows where to look to find the cracks in the windows and the doors, right? Um, and find that shit and release it. Okay, leaking is not enough. Uh, lack of stable distribution platforms in the early days, but fortunately now I think a little bit is, is better now uh, with torrents and uh, you know a lot of the 
technology y'all developed. A problem is oversaturation and desensitization. So like in the early days, like it was a revelation that you know you have like a police chief email sending racist stuff like that, uh, and you could get far. But now there's just they're muddying the water, but just by dumping so much fake news and disinfo that it is hard to distinguish reality. And so now it's just a everyone's perception is you know we all know that. Um, Diffusion by disinfo. Uh, limits of whistleblowing. So yeah, w a lot of whistleblowers, you know, who work within like these governments and stuff like that. Uh, first off, we do need to create incentives because we do want to welcome those. A lot of them do have like these. Once they see the dirt, they, maybe the f a few of them do join these things with uh, good intentions. I, maybe not police, the, uh, bullies, and so forth. But uh, nevertheless, maybe they have a crisis of conscience and we need to create welcoming environments to where they could uh, we could embrace them. But nevertheless, oftentimes I found that they have lingering allegiances and a belief that you could still appeal to the authorities uh, by you know they just like whistleblower programs with the government, like oh they'll uh, protect you. But you know what? You know, look what they did to uh, the ones who tried. You know, they prosecute and threaten and discredit and all the rest. Uh, and so I found that that resulted in a lot of half measures. Um, so, and also, uh, I don't can't remember if I talked. Uh, okay, I'll talk about it later. And then li uh, liberal media is complicit as well because either they're not going to be covering it uh, unless they have to. Like for example, the Pentagon Papers. You know, the, uh, or even Chelsea Manning went to several uh, reporting agencies and tried to release them, but they weren't trying to hear none of that. Right. Um, so they're kind of part of the problems. That's why we need like independent DIY journalism and stuff like that. This is where y'all come in. Uh, unfortunately, leaking, I would say, has not stopped the death march because now that we are aware of it, we all know government is spying on us. They're going to war and stuff like that. So just the knowledge of this fact, we've all known that, right? So we need to make hacking a threat again. Towards a more effective hacktivism, right? So, you know, again, like we can't all be the warriors. It's, it's, I would say that is extremely important that you know exactly what you're looking at before you even get involved in it, uh, and also let those who are around you know what your limitations are uh, before you get involved. Um, and then also, it's super important to uh, practice prisoner solidarity for those comrades got locked up in the line of duty. Uh, and now, first, I want to shout out Chaos Camp because I got a lot of postcards from this camp years ago, and it meant everything to me. It meant everything to me. I felt I, I'm so I can't tell you how happy I'm to be here with y'all. I think they are still also doing a jail to the mail thing that McFly was talking about. So there's, there's still lots of folks locked up behind bars. Um, and I will say enacting prisoner solidarity is, not, is, is important also because it emboldens the next line of those who were willing to think about whether they take the adventure because you are not alone. You will have a movement that got your back. And we'll see you through. We'll see you through the other end, right? Um, so study court documents, you know, the discovery, the indictments, read that shit, study the forensic reports, the advisors, see how they're caught. Um, I threw in here, reject law and order, the framing of ethical hacking. Yeah, we all know this shit, right? Uh, this is the big one, though. Know if and when to pull the trigger. Like, I, I alluded to it earlier, but, you know, not always it's a good idea to release immediately or attack immediately. For one, I, I would say this is one of the... When I first started getting anonymous and started looking at them, it was, it was so amazing and inspiring because they're getting some big targets off the rip, but there's an IRC. Oh, shit, got SQ uh, in uh, state gov. Go, what to, when to face? When to face? So I was like, nah, you got to go through the emails. You got to test all those hashes. You know, you got to probe and get all, all the mails, at least. If you ain't got the mails, you know, uh, before you pull the trigger. Um, and, but then again, you can't wait too long either because, of course, the window might close. Um, s less spectacle and more damage. All right, now, sma smashing a window, it, it shatters the myth of law and order and creates openings in which another world is possible. Um, but spe spectacle is great. Defacements are great. Um, but, man, why don't you just RMR off that shit? You know what I mean? Destroy that shit. Stratford, it took them like six weeks because I deleted like four servers completely, DD and shit. Like, <laughs> so uh, a defacement they might take down, but damage is forever, baby. <laughs> Less redactions and more doxing. Um, so I, I, I put this in because I was kind of a little bit uh, frustrated that, for example, the Snowden docs that released all these uh, slides of like you know, the NSA slides and all, all the prisms and all this stuff, right? But they didn't even release the names of the NSA agents or whoever fucking wrote them. Why the hell not? Why the hell not? Release that shit, man. Like, first off, in a lot of places around the world, police officers and stuff like that, you should be known and, well, we shouldn't have police in the first place. All cops are bastards. But it would be a thing to know who they are, so, <laughs> so but, uh, Never mind, uh, docs their, ad their addresses and all that shit. I will say, though, that you do have to go over the data because it's a lot of responsibility to be sitting on. I was hacking a lot of police stuff like that, and I'd have emails and stuff like that. And, for example, they would have um, jail rosters of people who are incarcerated in these jails uh, and people who are not even convicted uh, of a crime, for example, or also possibly victim witness statements and uh, so forth of domestic violence that we don't necessarily want to... Uh, obviously, we don't want to expose that stuff. because uh, So you, you do have a, a tremendous responsibility to parse through that data, which is, again, a lot of the work. When you hack some 80 gigs of emails, and shit, oh, man, I need a, I need a team for this. But... Uh, 
But there's no crew, only you. Don't wait either. But uh, that's why there's like these uh, networks. We have these journalism networks and WikiLeaks and alternatives to WikiLeaks, how we do us. Um, and don't be afraid to be the first. Don't be afraid to go all the way. I will say this. When I started getting arrested and stuff, it's like uh, my first time, um, I, I had 5,000 credit cards. Didn't use a single one, right? I talked about using a little bit. Oh, we're going to donate to all these causes that they hate. It would be great to charities and, and comic groups and stuff like that, right? But I didn't use them. But they still charged me as if I did it anyways, right? And they gave me the sentencing guidelines, 5,000 5, credit cards, $500, $2.5 million of damages, uh, uh, six uh, years over the statutory uh, maximum anyways. Like, dude, come on, man. Like, they're going to sentence you as if you did it anyway, so you may as well go all the way. Hell, half the time I've been arrested, <laughs> I've been time, yeah, you yeah, already know, man. And that's really all I have to say, to be honest. That's it. Woo! We're down for questions. Hey, please hit it. I'm an open book. I'm here all week, so hit. So there's, there's plenty of time for questions. Um, I will help moderate them. Jeremy? Is there a microphone? Yeah. Stand over here, because we need to not in the in the camera shop. Oh hi! I I will never thank you enough for all you've done in your entire life. I love you so much, both of you. Same. Same. Okay. I have. I have a short comment, I'll make it short, and I have a question for you. Uh, we heard 2009, we heard, we heard WikiLeaks named three times, we heard Vault 7, but you mentioned, you know, WikiLeaks as a platform, um, a bunch of journalists. My comment is that, to me, WikiLeaks also um, taught the world how to do journalism and data journalism. Taught the world how to do anti-censorship publishing and not just a pl platform. Uh, also, WikiLeaks taught us about source protection. Now, I haven't heard the, the name of Assange in your talk, and when the camp uh, ended four years ago, he was mentioned because four years ago he was fucking arrested and he's still in the worst prison in the UK for nothing today. So I wanted to ask you, does his case of uh, this violent character assassination campaign um, with this uh, fake doctored uh, accusations, the Niels Melzer, the, the UN reporter on, um, you know, demonstrated that the Swedish ra rape case was fabricated? This and the rest, is that the same tactics for, to discredit, to divide, and the such that you mentioned uh, earlier? And is there a US bias in the perception of the character of Assange that prevents uh, the, the unified and justified uh, campaign of support that uh, he, he and WikiLeaks and everybody else in WikiLeaks deserve? I, 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 okay, I, I could talk about the liberal media. Uh, well, for one, free Julian Assange and all political prisoners, all prisoners, just saying. Um, thanks for the question. It's a very uh, heavy one, right? Um, <clears throat> I will say this. Uh, it's true, like we mentioned earlier, that the, the United States especially uh, uses the campaigns to discredit those who stand up. The nail of stands up gets hammered down. Um, but it is also true that there is, uh, you know, a history of patriarchy and sexual abuse that, uh, you know, Anyone is uh, capable of doing it, and it is a uh, disappointing, and it is it needs to be, people need to be held accountable for their. Uh, uh, um. I can't comment on the specifics of the Assange, um, but I will say also that uh, one thing I like about the new generation of uh, whistleblowing platforms is that it is not necessarily uh, centered around uh, personalities or individuals. Which uh, that's why I mentioned earlier the martyrdom thing. Um, is that uh, because it's a failure. We all fail, right? Um, and we can list a lot of examples. I'm not even really specifically referring to Assange here. Um, so I'm just saying that it has a, a way of uh, lessening the problem of these uh, you know, abusers in our uh, organizations if they, we don't centralize power in that way. And I could speak to the kind of bias against Assange in his case in the United States and the liberal media. I think you're absolutely right. And I think it runs enormously deep for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of which is absolutely, you're right, that, you know, the American media um, in different moments of its history has been extremely spineless, completely spineless. And in fact, 
The Citizens Commission to expose the FBI, the Washington Post published the story, but they did not want to. They did not want to. The New York Times didn't want to. A bunch of editors kind of um, convinced Catherine Graham to release the information. At the time that WikiLeaks you know, came into being, you had Chelsea Manning who wanted to kind of show collateral murder. Reuters knew about that fucking video. They had seen it and they would not publish, right? And it was so important to have that platform. And I think because in some ways, like if I was some Freudian, Lacanian psychoanalyst, which I'm not, I think there's something really interesting about how Assange basically showed how spineless the American media was. Then things went sour, you know, and then it's insane to me because I've definitely have done events around Assange and, you know, there have been a lot of people who've come out and supported it, but it's not receiving the attention it needs because that is a threat to journalism. He does not deserve that. Um, so I really appreciate your question. And WikiLeaks is a key part of the story that we're telling. Um, but yeah, absolutely, in, in many deep ways. I will say also that they uh, tried to, you know, when they held me in contempt and wanted me to testify, saying Assange was like, you know, he asked you he was paying you, whatever the hell. He's like, dude, just because I don't necessarily agree with some of the Trump stuff earlier that I didn't agree, but that doesn't mean I still said, fuck you, I ain't saying shit, motherfucker, free, free the man, free the man. <laughs> We have five minutes, so questions, comments? Um, we have a crisis of journalism that is we're almost past facts, so nobody uh, believes in anything anymore. So how can journalism still expose stuff if no one believes anything anyway? I think there is an objective truth. You know what I mean? Uh, despite their attempts to muddy the water, um, with, with this info in this post-truth society, you're, you're right, you're right. That's why I said leaking may not be enough. Um, that's why, you know, if you get the docs, post it, yes, and maybe, maybe we can, and we should push hard to hold these people accountable once we find their information, right? But you're right, because then they could also create a counter-narrative, just make shit up. So that's why I'm saying just delete their shit, or just stalk them outside of the house, or do what, it, do what you need to do, but they, they should not be around working military no more if you know what you know about them. Yeah. I also, um, I'm an anthropologist, and we sort of, um, our bread and butter is conspiracy at some level. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, historically we tended to be like, oh, look at the chupacabra, which is this like goat sucking alien in, in Puerto Rico, which is where I'm from. And I'm like, I love the chupacabra. And it's really about colonialism and post-colonialism and extraction. And I, I will say that as much as I hate the far right and the right, I do actually think that Part of the problem, again, I go back to like the liberal media and, and, and these sorts of things, is that um, you know, they haven't been historically aggressive enough going after the powerful, right? And so sometimes you get these conspiracy theories that kind of have like a kernel of truth, right? And so as you sort of rebuild um, journalism, you also have to like, you know, I got my vaccines and Pfizer, you know, helped create it, but Pfizer has done a lot of really fucked up things as well, right? And so we have to hold these corporations really accountable because I, I think that helps um, breed conspiracy as well. And as kind of Jeremy said, like if you're not doing that, then that creates the conditions. But it's gonna be a long time. Historically, these have come in waves before. So I hope that um, we overcome the wave before we destroy the planet with climate change. That's my big worry now. Okay. We have two more minutes. We have one more question, and we need to fix, uh, get that in this two minutes. Can we take the two questions side by side? And I'll just let... Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll be quick. Um, first of all, like everybody, thanks to both of you for all the great work you've done. Uh, thanks for coming and talking to us. You said that the postcards from here helped you while you were in prison, and I was wondering, like, because it was a long time, right? And uh, what, what helped you carry through? That's what I like, what, what else right. is helpful to do? And the second half of the question, now that you're out, are you completely free or are you still under some conditions and what is your life like, like not what is your life like, but right. like, what's your situation <laughs> right. now? <laughs> Thanks. Um, you're right, so prison and jail is, is an extremely dehumanizing and isolating place. They're trying to break you. They're trying to break your spirits. But one thing I've learned is that they can take your body, but they can't take your mind. It's that last yeah. inch, you're free. Yeah. Um, 
And so being an isolating place, you know, it's a whole world of fences and walls trying to separate. It is a whole micronation where they're basically second classes and stuff. But uh, so I do a lot of political prisoner work and books to prisoners and, and support now is, is one of my main things. And um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to pierce that wall. We're trying to climb that wall and, and reach out and make connections with folks to let them know that they're not alone. It's a very despair, despairing place. Um, and so uh, just knowing that you're heard, for one, um, and just knowing that uh, you got people out there that got your back means everything. Um, and so what I do, like you said, uh, what conditions and stuff, yeah, yeah when I got out, um, I had three years paper, and uh, yeah, I was on this internet monitoring program where it's like a private company that had to actually pay for it, all my devices that monitored my messages and, and stuff like that, and uh, actually had to upload my uh, all messages uh, every day, and then my PO would be like, who is this you're talking to? It was, it was terrible. So that's why it's, I've been out two years, though, and uh, fortunately I had some uh, lawyers who uh, all the way supported me. Uh, shout out to Legal Aid, shout out to National Lawyers Guild, by the way, and I'm sure you all have the equivalents because they, they've always had my back, and uh, often for free. So. Uh, they, uh, in my case, they actually fought uh, the conditions uh, on free speech and associate. They said I couldn't even associate with hackers, couldn't even associate with civil disobedience. What the hell that means, right? I mean, and it was like that the first time too, as a matter of fact. But I still did what I did, though. You know what I mean? Um, but fortunately, my lawyers did beat that uh, with motions after we got the judges transferred over to Chicago and stuff like that. One thing I'll say, though, is that you know, I did two federal sentences for hacking and I got arrested dozens of times. I don't regret any of it. My only regret is that I was not, um, didn't have give a chance to finish any of the targets I was working on. You know, like. <laughs> So, can you do the really quick? Because then I would take this as the last quick answer, a quick question. So, if we're talking about hacking and leaking now, I'm wondering what you guys, obviously not ideologically, but what you think about ransomware groups, and if you think that journalists or academics will touch the data that ransomware groups are leaking, because they're pushing out gigabytes and gigabytes of data from big companies. What, what do you think about that as a phenomenon? Um, yeah, it's interesting because I feel like, I, you know, I haven't monitored them as closely, but they certainly have changed their tactics where they're pulling back a little bit against like hospitals and then going against targets where they might um, hit a law firm that worked for Trump, um, take the emails and then DDoS secrets uh, host them. And I, I actually really respect what DDoS secrets is doing, which takes a kind of equal opportunity hosting the stuff um, they make some stuff public some stuff they just give to researchers because that stuff is really really important and you know there still isn't quite enough people going through um, this material and i also do suspect that ransomware groups are probably strategizing a little bit in terms of choosing targets that will help them monetarily but maybe draw in a little bit of public sympathy as well but there is material out there right and um, I think having the public, journalists, others really go through that stuff can yield some really, really important insights. And that is something that, you know, many of us are well positioned to do today. I just want real quick, I just want to say that I don't think we should necessarily knock uh, criminal hacking or hacking for survival. Those who, as a means, must learn how to scam copy cards or uh, credit card fraud just because, hey, people are going to do what they have to do to survive. And we can, you know, I've been... I, when I was in jail and stuff like that, I didn't think myself no better or no less than anybody else that was in there. You know what I mean? And frankly, I, I would, the second time when I got out, I, I made a decision to go hard as possible I could and go after governments and all this stuff. I was like, all gas, right? But I still got 10. In the United States, that's actually uh, relatively medium to low. So I'm there with 10s and 20s and 30s and life for people just wrong place, wrong time, doing what they have to do to survive and stuff like that. So I'm a little bit humbled and not so like judgment about uh, criminal hacking, which I think is still within our rubric. So do what you got to do. Okay, then uh, thank the two of you for coming over here and uh, actually giving the talk. Um, and yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Anna and Biela Coleman. Hi.